my name's Susan Marks, and I'm delighted to welcome you this evening and to introduce our speaker, Professor Marty Koskinyemi, who's very kindly agreed to be with us for two weeks as visiting professor. Professor Koskinyemi is academy professor with the University of Helsinki. He additionally holds or has held many distinguished visiting professorships, including with the Hauser Global Law Program at NYU, and he's been the Arthur Goodhart Visiting Professor at the University of Cambridge. He served for many years as legal advisor at the Finnish Foreign Ministry, and he continues to be an influential protagonist in policy debates in that country. He's held as well many important offices at international level, including serving as a judge of the Asian Development Bank and as a member of the UN International Law Commission and has played leading roles in many non-governmental and professional organizations at international level, including the Institut de Droit International. But while all of that is, of course, tremendously impressive, none of it really explains why so many of you have come to hear him today, and nor does it explain why so many people come to hear him whenever and wherever he speaks. That has to do, of course, with what he's written the extraordinarily insightful, imaginative, and influential body of scholarship that includes From Apology to Utopia, his first English language uh, book, uh, published initially in 1989, and then reissued uh, with a new epilogue by CUP in 2005. The Gentle Civilizer of Nations, also published by CUP in 2002, and the many, many wonderful, seminal, massively inspiring articles now happily brought together by Richard Hart in a volume entitled The Politics of International Law, which appeared last year. And there's a corresponding volume uh, that appeared with Pedon uh, in French as well. I'm only mentioning, of course, some of his many uh, writings. These are writings that are in the rare category to which the label path-breaking truly belongs. And of course, once the path has been broken, there's no return to the landscape of earlier times. It's irrevocably altered. Indeed, it takes considerable effort to reconstruct in one's mind how the field of international law seemed before these great works of theory and history had come along. Certainly, if I can speak pers personally for a moment, I can't conceive of working other than uh, in relation to and in dialogue with uh, Marty and uh, his, his multitude of other interlocutors. So it's an immense personal pleasure as well as a very great honor to welcome Marty to the LSE and now to give him the floor. His title, as you see, is Histories of International Law Dealing with Eurocentrism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Also, I have to start by saying how exceedingly happy I am to be here in London. I've spent a lot of time in England, and to me, England is a place where there are only students, graduate students, and professors, and a few Sainsbury's here and there. <laughs> I've gone through London a number of times, never spent here more than two nights in a row, so these two weeks will really be an experience that I look forward to. So my title is Histories of International Law Dealing with Eurocentrism. Let me start by reminding us that Münster and Osnabrück are small German towns uh, in today's North, North Rhine, Westphalia, and Lower Saxony. But they provide the setting for the conclusion of the Peace of Westphalia, of course, in 1649, the single most important event in the history of international law. Westphalia remains center, central to the imagination of the profession. It was then that international law emerged as a law of states, understood as legal subjects or persons distinct from their ruling elites or dynasties. Those places have been followed by other locations. Vienna, Berlin, Paris, Geneva. Looking for the origins of the law among sovereigns, 
We focus on Europe, its towns, its wars, its revolutions, Baudin, Hobbes, Grotius, and so on. The histories of Jus Gentium, of Völkerrecht, of Droit des Gens are intensely European histories. They adopt a European vocabulary of progress and modernity. The key distinctions between notions such as the political, the economic, secular, religious, as well as private and public are of course part of the European mindset. Even as colonialism has now become an increasingly important topic in the history and doctrine of international law, it still remains the case that, as Dipesh Chakrabarti has put it, Europe rules as the silent reference of historical knowledge. This is true not only of the materials or, uh, of the narrative, but of the standards of historiography itself. What kind of history of international law would it be that would not speak of the fall of the Roman Republic, of the religious wars, or of balance of power in Europe in the 19th century? European stories and myths and metaphors continue to set the imagination of international lawyers. When did this begin then? Professional international law started in the 1860s as part of the liberal entrenchment in Europe as the clouds of nationalism, racism, socialism were emerging. It began as a project of practical men, not out of philosophical contemplation. What these men aimed at was to civilize the behavior of their nations, but of other nations too, including, of course, the colonies. They included the Belgian professor Ernst Nys, who eventually became the first historiographer of the new profession. Nys had taught history and jurisprudence at the, at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. In the opening chapters of his Le droit international, les principes, les, thé les théories et les faits, Nice recounted the history of international law as part of the expansion of Europe in the world. By 1904, he recounted 54 states in the international community, of which 22 were European and 21 American. The remaining ones were Japan, Liberia, and the independent state of the Congo. Nis accepted the division of humankind into civilized, barbarian, and savage peoples. He read the 1885 Act of Berlin as a powerful illustration of the will of European powers to advance the well-being of the colonies. In due course, he would vigorously defend the practices of his king, Leopold II of the Congo, against the accusations that he attributed to the commercial interests in Manchester. Nis founded the origins of international law, as he called them, in the European Renaissance and its crystallization in the Peace of Westphalia. Three great ideas had uh, dominated history, he argued. Progress, freedom, and the idea of humanity. With progress, this meant European modernity as he saw it around himself. With freedom, he meant liberation from the Catholic Church. And with humanity, the view of all human societies joined in a universal community resembling the Europe he saw around himself. According to Nis, nice, it was Hugo Grotius, a Protestant who founded the science of international law by joining humanism and secularism with Roman law. 
Nis confessed himself an admirer of England's liberties that for him meant civilization, secularization, humanism, and the universal freedom of trade. Together with the balance of power, these, he said, would form the basis of international law. Later historians have, of course, extended this narrative to the present. The long entries on the history of international law in the 1962 Wörterbuch des Völkerrechts, prepared by the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, use the peace of Westphalia as the definitive break between the ancient origins and the modern, and the modern present, the time of European international law, as the Wörterbuch puts it. The 19th century, according to the Wörterbuch, was the time of the expansion of European international law. In this account, the standard account that, all, that we all have learned, European hegemony was broken only late in the 20th century, above all with the establishment of the United Nations. In the 1960s, international law began to expand in the different humanitarian, economic, and technical fields. This, we now read, led from the political form of statehood into some form of universal existence, perhaps globalization, perhaps as Wilhelm Greve, the author of the most widely read textbook of the history of international law, put it in the year 2000, into an uncertain oscillation between international community on the one side, a single superpower on the other. This familiar account of European modernity was first told by late 19th century European elites. Today we meet it at institutions of higher learning everywhere. Its point is to inculcate in the members of the professional classes a certain manner of reflecting on the world and on our place in it. Cultural markers such as antiquity, the Renaissance, and globalization are as much part of it as our technical terms such as cannon shot rule, concept of Europe, or humanitarian intervention. All such notions bear the mark of their European origin. But they still enable lawyers from all over the world to communicate with each other by invoking widely shared historical associations and a teleology in which an idealized Europe coded as nationhood, capitalism, modernity, the rule of law, marks the horizon of the professional imagination. Nis formalized the practice of writing the history of international law as an account of European expansion to world dominance. The non-European world appeared occasionally in the form of the infidel Turk or the Saracens, interesting as, as partners in war or trade, or as the enigmatic world of China that refused to open its secrets to European diplomats. Late 19th century jurists were not uncritical admirers of Europe's colonial past, however. As Protestant liberals, they attacked religious and imperial justifications for Europe's expansion. But they were enthralled by what they called civilization and sought to capture it within a narrative of secularization, state formation, and economic modernity. What they witnessed at home. That narrative allowed Europeans to make distinctions they needed, the, the distinctions between civilized and uncivilized, without having to explain too much. It was never a part of a grand theory. After the great European war, however, that language, the language of civilization, was discredited and replaced slowly by the languages of progressive sociology modernization, economic and technological development. In the 1960s, these languages were integrated into international law itself. 
International law became a project of free trade, third world modernization, human rights, environmental protection, fight against impunity, and setting up international authorities to protect vulnerable populations. 20th century lawyers have been more embarrassed to articulate the normative goal of international law. The expression civilized nations appears still in the statute of the International Court of Justice, where it was put in 1920 by the Belgian lawyer Baron de Caen, one of the defenders of King Leopold's practices in the Congo. But that reference is now routinely exercised as an anachronism. International law now appears as a modernizing project, a state-building project, a project of economic and technological development, conserving natural resources and seeing to global security. Projects that appear functional, factual, and scientific with no bias in any direction at all. The historical section of the late Nino Cassese's recent textbook notes that while the international rules and principles of the 19th century were a product of the Western civilization, the composition of the world community, he writes, has now changed radically so that, and I quote from Nino, at least at the normative level, the international community is becoming more integrated and what is more important, such values as human rights and the need to promote development are increasingly permitting various sectors of international law. This view is familiar and originates in Europe. Europe is ubiquitous in today's international law and institutions. Progress is depicted by reference to an international community, that international community being imagined as the various developmental stages that Europeans have projected on their own world. Viewing the shifts of vocabulary from the 16th century Spanish scholastics to good governance today, Tony Angi, um, uh, a colleague um, in the uh, Third World Movement, concluded that, and I quote from him, whatever the contrast and transitions in that period, imperialism remains constant, unquote. In writing this, he was making the old point about Europe always imagining its values as universal, its knowledge, its science, as not only valid for itself, but valid for all. Whatever generosity may be uh, in, uh, involved, the point is never about good intentions. When Western speech becomes universal, its native speakers, the West, will be running the show. There are two ideal types of international legal history. Realist narratives that concentrate on state power and geopolitics. Idealist ones that focus on lawyers and philosophers, legal principles and institutions. Neither one of these we now know is sustainable alone without help from its counterpart. They are best seen as presumptive positions or biases the one foregrounding war and diplomacy as historic determining forces, and the other privileging laws, institutions, and doctrines. In both, however, the non-European world is reduced to an object of either Europe's policy or Europe's thought. As an example of the former is the classic Arthur Nussbaum's concise history of the law of nations uh, in, from the 1950s, that concentrates on diplomacy and treaty relations. During the period from 1648 to 1815, we encounter the Ottoman Empire and what Nussbaum uh, refers to as countries outside Europe in only four pages devoted to treaty relations with Europe. The 19th century 
in, in Nussbaum's book, is addressed by reference to consular relations with Turkey, the widening of international law in South America, and the open door policy in China. <coughs> Nussbaum concludes those brief passages with the following note. The widening of the Western law of nations to the Far East did not involve the fusion of European or Asiatic ideas. Even if the law had become universal, it had not been rooted in non-European minds." Unquote. Wilhelm Greve's widely read uh, ultra-realist account of international law follows Carl Schmitt's Nomos der Erde and finds a place for the non-European world as an object of European land-taking, land landsname. The foundations of international legal community, Greve writes, lies with what he calls the Occidental Christian community. After the late Middle Ages, the voice of Christianity was seized by the succession of French, um, Spanish, French, and British empires. The 20th century interwar Anglo-American condom condominium and finally, what Greve calls the global community dominated by the West. Greve was in ironic agreement with post-colonial histories that have likewise read doctrinal writings as a soft glove over the imperial fist. As Greve wrote, and I wrote from him, the newly discovered continents were only an object of European political maneuvering. They were not a self-reliant sphere of activity with its own centers of gravity." Unquote. In such geopolitical histories, large imperial centers radiate their influence all over the world and determine the nature of the global legal order. Many kinds of critiques can be made of them. No empire is ever homogeneous, but is always split against itself split by uncertainty of where its interests lie and what should be done to realize them. Internal oppositions and sectoral interests clash and imperial agents in the colonies tend to act unpredictably. The external world is never a passive receptacle but always plays the centers, um, factions against each other using imperial favor or opposition to advance its agendas. Realist history also fails to account for the conflicting regimes of knowledge and, and um, interest that turn hegemonies into more or less stable foundations for policy. It has no sense for the dependence of imperial policy on epistemic and political frameworks. And it is unclear, finally, whether histories of the Kreind, Schmidt, Greve, other realists have written, are histories of law at all. Their tendency, after all, is to reduce normative languages to pale reflections of the forces of realpolitik in a way that fails to account for the shifting uses of law between hegemonic and non-hegemonic actors. Law itself, we now know, is never the single norm, but it's always the norm and the exception, the principle and the counter-principle, the justification and the critique of hegemony. Idealist histories concentrating on <coughs> doctrines and institutions fare no better. Albert de Lapradel's Maître et Doctrine de Droit de Jean from 1950 includes only accounts of lives and writings of a few European men, jurists, diplomats, legal thinkers. The Alsatian Robert Retzlob's history of the Ford Grand Principe, Great Principles of International Law, the binding force of treaties, the freedom of state, equality, and solidarity are viewed through a perspective of 2,000 years of Western legal thought and policy. A more recent work of a decade ago by Agnes Leibovitch does focus on the universality of international law, but limits itself to what European philosophers have said about that matter. 
Although this work puts intersubjectivity in its philosophical center, no non-European voice is heard in it. Histories of cosmopolitan legal thought, likewise, invariably discuss the Western tradition, assumed to begin with the Stoics always and peak in Cicero, Grotius, Kant, Wilson. We know that narrative. An additional problem in such works is the way they aim to carry out a timeless conversation on perennial problems of jurisprudence between the living and the dead. As if legal rules, institutions, and vocabularies traveled unchanging to, through time, or then perhaps developed in their full maturity only in the present. This, of course, is to commit the sin of anachronism. Legal concepts are parts, uh, part of the legal and political vocabularies of each period. Their meaning cannot be seized without a grasp of that vocabulary. Projecting an unchanging meaning for a notion such as Ro Robert, Robert Redslop's Four Principles or Leibovitch's Dilemma of Humanity of State and Statehood uh, is to have no sense of what these notions meant for those who spoke them or used them uh, in earlier periods. The meaning we now know uh, of notions such as sovereignty, jus gentium, property, or indeed law, is dependent on what one intends to use them for, what one wants to achieve through them. This is especially obvious for such, polemic, for such a polemical language as law, through which we seek to support ourselves and our friends against those who stand as adversaries at conferences or perhaps university boardrooms. It is true that it's not always clear what the right context or language is in which those notions should be inserted. Is it the, or is it the lawyer's academic or professional context or the political or economic world where the first person operates? Is it a context of books or of guns, exchanges of language or exchanges of money? Such disagreements highlight a larger point, namely that histories of international law come, come to us through the historian's own prejudices that underline the political and rhetorical aspects of legal history itself. But whether we focus on geopolitics or legal doctrines, historiographies of international law have been as Eurocentric as the world they describe. Nevertheless, there is today some acknowledgement of international law's complicity in European expansion. In France, for example, in her recent history of international law's welfareist ambitions, Emmanuel Jouanet points to the nonchalance with which European jurists dealt with colonization. Only five pages of Emer de Vattel's 900-page classic uh, 1758 treaties on the law of nations were uh, devoted to the matter. Europe, Jouanet writes, is only interested in itself. This applies today too. <laughs> Most writing on the history of international legal thought is oriented towards classical themes of European political and legal theory. An exception has been the Marxist school of Rennes, whose most important representative today, Monique Chemier Gandron, and, and has written her, uh, her book, Humanité et Souveraineté, in order to discuss col the colonial implications of Western la law, but also Western legal rationality. It includes long sections of West uh, discussions of Western domination and Western rationality, and celebrates what she calls la raison flou of the colonized. Slim Lagmani's recent history of international law in Paris and Tunis, juxtaposes the Christian and the Islamic views on just war. Uh, 
Europe and European jurists remain in the centre, nevertheless, and European geopolitics rules. Lagmani's anti-imperial voice still stands out in the profession. It's not at all obvious how to correct the bias in the discipline. Early post-colonial works such as C.H. Alexandrovitz, those by C.X. Alexandrovitz, R.P. Anand, and T.O. Elias, for example, insist to examine also the practices of Asian and African communities before the entry of Europeans in those territories. But their intention was usually to prove that they too had an international law in those faraway territories. This is why those narratives can be objective, objective as once again projecting European categories as universal. To argue that there was natural law in India too, or diplomatic immunities in the Chinese realm, may finally turn out to support the universal na nature of notions that are, in a relevant sense, still <coughs> European, at least determined from the inside of the European uh, consciousness. This is so especially if the argument is accompanied, as it often is, with the accusation of hypocrisy, that Europeans themselves did not uh, follow European standards. The claim of hypocrisy fires back as reinforcement of the originally European notion, of course. <clears throat> A subsequent generation of critics have attacked this kind of conceptual Eurocentrism. Tony Angi, whom I mentioned already, and a group of scholars around him, have argued that international law has from the outset operated as an instrument of European expansion. For these historians, international law is imperialist all the way down. Or to quote Angi himself, it is fundamentally animated by the civilizing mission that is an inherent aspect of imperial expansion, which, Angie writes, from time immemorial has presented itself as improving the lives of conquered peoples, unquote. <clears throat> but if that is so, then any use of international law, even a critical use, will be Eurocentric, and there is no reason of, uh, for pride if past indigenous institutions have resembled European ones. Those are corrupt institutions, instruments of domination and illegitimate control. Instead, what one needs to do is to attack those concepts and practices at their root by showing their historical and present uses as instruments of colonial oppression. The rule of law would in such case not be an antidote to war and oppression, but an incident of them. But post-colonial critics such as Angie do not go quite that far. With good reason, for this would be to commit the same mistake as realist accounts, namely to reduce the law into a passive reflection of imperial desire. In a recent essay, Angie confesses to a certain bewilderment about the fact that although he has written on the imperial origins, he has also found international law often useful in the defense of third world interests. Sunjia Pahuja, in a recent book, has discussed the hopes and disappointments experienced by the third world in relation to laws regarding decolonization and development. Formal independence turned out, we know now, disappointing. Nothing came of the new international economic order. Nevertheless, she writes, with good reason, principles such as sovereignty and the vocabularies of self-determination have every now and then assisted the third world in uh, opposing colonial hegemonic purposes. Strategic awareness is needed, of course, including awareness of the fact that mere alignment of the law with the interests of the third world elites is often insufficient. Very often, one sees third world jurists slide from a sophisticated critique into an uncritical nationalist advocacy. 
So how to go about using it, using notions of European origin for non-Eurocentric purposes? Let me sketch at the end four avenues for doing this. One consists in the demonstration of the colonial origins of international legal rules and institutions. It is not at all difficult to show the way in which such key notions as property and sovereignty have been formed in the context of the discovery and settlement of the New World. Hugo Grotius and John Locke possessed a theory of occupation that only accepted European forms of agriculture as capable of establishing property rights on land. On the other hand, their notion of political sovereignty did not include indigenous forms of communal life. Notoriously, too, the laws of war came to be defined in such a fashion as to encompass only European methods of killing. Much recent work on the history of the law of development has been inspired by an objective to show how it has imposed Eurocentric ideas about modernity, development, and technical standards. Jennifer Beard, for example, has shown how what she calls the inner logic of economic growth and technological advance has qualified large part of the world as an underdeveloped terrain whose populations were to be rapidly incorporated by enacting law for the protection of foreign investors. In a similar, similar way, Anne Orford has discussed humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect in view of classical political theory that creates a nexus, nexus between, between protection and obedience. This, she argues, now provides the best frame for understanding the asymmetries of recent United Nations operations in the Third World. Colonial domination today operates in the shadow of internationalization and through the instrumentali instrumentality of international institutions. Another way of dealing with Eurocentrism by focusing on the is by uh, dealing with Eurocentrism by focusing on the encounter between Europe and the New World as an important or even crucial moment to the discipline of international law itself. This could take place by laying out the rules and practices and by recounting the pure facts of the encounter. The making of the first treaties, for example, building the settlements and the entreports, the endless warfare with the natives, efforts at evangelization, and so on. Many histories of this type have been written by political historians, less so by lawyers at this point. Surprisingly, no general work on the international law aspects of the moment of encounter or of colonization has yet been published. Beyond Jörg Fischi's work, The Europäische Expansion und das Völkere from 1984. Fisch, a student of Reinhard Goselek's, the father of Begriffsgeschichte, presented an extensive and nuanced account of the asymmetries and injustices, but also of the temporal and geographical variations of the colonial enterprise in legal terms. He also gave room to occasional reciprocity and the varying hierarchies in which, for example, in the Chinese sphere, Europeans sometimes found themselves in a subordinate position. Fish likewise gave an over 200-page account of the self-interpretations of the Europeans of what they were doing at the time of the colonization itself. That is to say, a history of the development of European law of occupation by reference to the status of overseas territories. Against Carl Schmitt's famous doctrine of the nomos of the earth that pictured a massive European land taking in the colonies as, the found, as a foundation ex nihilo um, of European public law, Fish maintains that the overseas territories were never a rechtslehre raum, a legal vacuum. This is a historical debate of great momentum, I suggest, and lies still unresolved. 
but its protagonists agree that from early 18th century onwards, the law between European sovereigns was constructed largely in opposition to the law that was applicable overseas. To maintain that notion, uh, maintain that contrast, Europe and overseas, broad notions such as civilization, Christianity, modernity, and development direct even universal international law today in a particular direction. Fish was among the first to detect the persistence of colonial relations in law even after the attainment of formal independence in the 1960s. I want to stress this because his study is still the most complete work on the now fashionable theme of international law and empire, but it's not widely read owing to the disappointing Anglocentrism in international law today. The centrality of the Spanish 16th century theologians for the discipline uh, has long been known. The Dominicans, Francisco de Vitoria, Bartolome de las Casas, have been traditionally seen as the great humanitarian friends of the Indians. A different view of them has emerged lately. It is true, critics say, that the Dominicans disapproved of the way the conquest had been carried out, but the lawful titles that these men granted to the Spanish uh, easily compensated for their critique of the illegitimate ones. Both Vitoria and Las Casas accepted the presence of Spain in the Indies for reasons of evangelization and never suggested they should depart they were apologists of empire, of course, concerned over its legitimacy, but not its ultimate purpose. I wonder, however, to what extent this view renders the Dominicans as symbols, something to, symbols of something too uniform, Spanish imperialism or European colonialism, for example. As Vitoria began his famous analysis of Spanish actions at Salamanca, there was no clear view of where Spanish interests, or Castilian interests more relevantly, lay, or what the position of the Catholic Church ought to be towards the inhabitants of the New World. Vitoria's so-called universalism, as it finally emerged from his Relecciones Theologicae, was so open-ended that it could be and would be used to defend the most different kinds of policies. Much of international law originates in those debates, and we have much to learn from them. But we have little reason to attack uh, Vitoria, Las Casas, or the other Spaniards, as, uh, either as apologists of empire or for celebrating them as humanitarian heroes. The lesson they provide is the lesson of ambiguity. Love may be difficult to distinguish from a desire to dominate, which is not to say that no distinction should be made between the two. Studies of the colonial encounter provide a sufficient amount of gruesome materials that might be used as Protestants have always used them in terms of the legenda negra, so as to shock, so as to shock the reader into an anti-colonial consciousness. But the many stories might equally well be used to distinguish between different moments and locations uh, of the encounter and to bring the various uses of the legal vocabulary into light that sometimes follow the convenience of the Europeans, but sometimes decidedly not. These narratives might focus uh, on the innumerable ways in which Europeans failed to understand, often to their own disadvantage, the cultures they came to contact with. Yet another theme under this uh, technique might be to analyze the shifts between formal and informal control through which European domination has, was, uh, has been created and ensured. It would, for example, be very important to study the role of the expansion of European origin private law rules over contracts and property and the use of cat's paw techniques with native allies to carry out dispossession or establish informal domination. 
A third way to deal with Eurocentrism might add direct attention to the hybridization of legal concepts as they travel from the colonial metropolis into the peripheries and their changing uses in the hands of the colonized. This approach might, for example, examine particular actor, actors in the colonies, jurists, politicians, resistance fighters, using European concepts, but turning them to support a particular project or preference of the colonized. A good example of this would be Nathaniel Berman's discussion of the debates between the French colonial and anti-colonial intelligentsias during the War of the Rift in 1925, uh, which was instrumentalized by the charismatic rebel leader, uh, reader, uh, leader Abdel Karim for his anti-colonial purposes. Or those narratives might focus on Latin American Creole elites' use of international law in the 19th century in order to support local hegemony, both vis-a-vis -vis Europeans as well as uh, more backwards inhabitants of those territories. Latin American international law textbooks of the 19th century adopted a vocabulary and a style that was uniquely Latin American and supported not at all passive assimilation to the reign of Europe, but to assert Latin American distinctiveness from it. Such studies complicate the homogeneous idea of Europeanization by undermining uh, the view that the surface adoption of European concepts would always have the same um, consequences. Or indeed that it would always operate in favor of something like Europe. Yet another fourth technique is to exoticize or provincialize, as Dipesh Chakrabanti would say, Europe and European law. In my own gentle civilizer of nations, I tried to give close anthropological at attention to the contexts in which international law emerged as a cultural sensibility among a class of late 19th century European liberal Protestant elites. Instead of depicting it as a part of some universal metaphysic, I described international law as a platform or a vocabulary for a political project of a small group uh, of activist lawyers, hoping to make it appear as a narrow and indeed exotic aspect of fin de siècle European culture. Such genealogies, and there are others, operate to pinpoint the particular that is hidden by the discipline's universal voice. This I take also to be the point of recent studies that have interpreted early modern writers such as Grotius and Locke from the perspective of their activity as legal counsel, counsel for the Dutch East India Company or a shareholder of the Virginia Company. Showing the close connection between the doctrine of the freedom of seas and Dutch colonial interest in the 17th century contextualizes the relevant rules. It does not firmly delegitimize them, of course, but it makes, them visi but it makes visible the relations of power that they entail. This also applies to accounts of the mandate system of the League of Nations or of the ideas of international executive authority within the United Nations that read them as reactions to the collapse of forms of imperial rule and efforts to maintain some, some amount of control over the periphery. Again, the point is to, to make that which presents itself as timeless and universal as contextually bound to particular projects or interests. Eurocentrism might then be destabilized with the realization that Europe itself is just a continent with its particular interests and neuroses, its violence and its stupidity, rather like realizing that the choice for a French restaurant is also to opt for ethnic food. I want to make a final point. A standard way to deal with Eurocentrism has been to ask the question of whether or not non-Europeans were included or excluded from international law. This question, I suggest, 
is based on the Eurocentric assumption that being included is good because international law is good, whereas exclusion needs to be condemned. But this cannot be right. The key question cannot be whether somebody is included or excluded, but what inclusion and exclusion mean. Among the merits of Angie's classic post-colonial analysis is the way the inclusion by the Spanish Dominicans of the American Indians in the Christian system of natural law and use gentium is shown to operate as a means to discipline the Indians. In this case, exclusion would have been a sign of respect. It seems pointless to engage in a controversy about the morality of Vittoria, the man, however, and important instead to stress the ambivalence of his options. Then as now, it all depends. The meaning and status of an encounter cannot be determined in abstraction from its meaning to its participants. And these cannot be known independently of recourse to assumptions about what they must have thought. That is, what seems right to us. The four techniques that I briefly sketched try to avoid taking the meaning of any encounter as a given and look instead for interpretative imagination and the agency of everyone concerned. Europeanization is a complex phenomenon. It may serve different agendas at different moments. It remains important for post-Eurocentric research in the history of international law uh, that the mere employment of a particular vocabulary of intervention, for instance, natural law, positivism, Christianity, or jihad, is not taken alone as informative of how we should assess the speaker of, uh, of those languages or the relations of power addressed by it. Different actors use such languages for different purposes and everything will depend again on the context, the definition of which will be disputed. For example, the application of formal sovereignty and UN membership in the colonies since the 1960s has done little to abolish factual inequality in the world, but it may have made that inequality slightly more invisible and thus slightly less politically vulnerable. Whether it has done this, however, is a matter of research still un undertaken and not the application of dogma. Now what could be expected of non-Eurocentric histories? Keeping an eye on past imperialism and its traces in today's world. Of course this cannot be a plea for a fully objective history. History vs. eigentlich gewesen sei. That sort of knowledge is not open to us. There is no point from which to view history, that would not be a particular standpoint. To the contrary, new histories must highlight the contested and political nature of any readings of the past. In recent years, there's been a massive increase in histories of international law. Some of this is an effect of the rising post-colonial consciousness in the profession. Much is also inspired, I think, by a sense of history's importance for understanding and coming to grips with the ambivalence of the set of phenomena that is, that is broadly labeled modernity, globalization, and so on. Old histories were progress narratives. They projected European modernity as the telos, as the objective of history. This is no longer believable. But nor can the opposite view of law as a mere apology of European or Western power be sustained. If grand history is over, this means the end of his stories of linear progress and linear decline. History becomes then, perhaps once again, stories that illuminate the ambivalence and reality of the choices we make and have to make. It would not be magistra vitae in the sense of providing ready-made lessons or blueprints or a storehouse of uh, but a storehouse 
of narratives of wisdom and stupidity, political courage and moral corruption in a complex world. This is a kind of teleological history, nevertheless, I want to suggest. For it calls on the historian to judge the present in view of her preferred futures. Positivism, too, is dead, you see. We are always in some frame writing our histories and understandings from an always already committed standpoint. Historical vocabularies are, to use Paul de Man's familiar image, mechanisms of blindness and mechanisms of insight. A shift of vocabulary enables us to see things that were previously hidden, but they also inevitably throw some things into the dark. The point would not be to write global history in which everything would be visible. That's, of course, impossible. But to diminish the power of blindness so as to see better. Thank you. of the tenacious Eurocentricity of international legal history writing and some indications of how we might now get beyond it. He's graciously agreed to respond to questions and comments and we have uh, some time for that. So who would like to start the discussion? Um. Thank you for this lecture. I mean, uh, throughout the lecture, I was listening to you, and I know that it's about the history of international and perhaps the US uh, or the United States American doctrine of international doesn't have much place in the history of international law. But at least recently, uh, there are many works which I think it would just uh, continue on your narrative that international law is used instrumentally, so the writings by scholars such as Jack Goldsmith or Eric Posner, are intended to show that Europe is using international instrumentally to tame the power of the United States. But you haven't mentioned the American scholarship on international at all. So does it fit your story somewhat, or why, why didn't you do that? Well, I did mention American scholarship, and as much as I mentioned Arthur Nussbaum's concise history of international law. It's true that, that there are uh, professors of law at American universities nowadays who write on something they call international law, very little of, of, of it. I hardly recognize that, and I don't think of it as a, a significant intellectual um, series of events or writings. Uh, maybe there is a moment to engage with it sometimes in the future. Now I just have no interest in it. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I just have a question about legal anthropology. Um, because many of the early anthropologists of the colonial encounter were lawyers. And many of them, post-colonialism, have felt a lot of guilt about the legal categories imposed on the non-West. And also the ways in which um, Western, non-Western legal um, laws were effectively constructed as the opposite of Western laws by Western anthropologists. And so there's been at least 50 years worth of, of uh, material in legal anthropology that covers exactly the four strategies that you mention. So I know you're speaking more about international law and perhaps anthropology is focused um, a lot on domestic law, but it has focused quite su substantively on the imposition of Western legal categories, and I wondered why you haven't made reference to that discipline to any great degree. It's true. There's, there's no more tormented part of the legal profession than the, the part of legal anthropologists. So the self-examinations there are painful reading, and one wonders what's going to come of, of legal anthropology, and anthropologists wonder about this as well, legal anthropologists. Now, my, no, my sense of what international law is, the profession of international law, is a, is a very narrow one. I think of people 
politically oriented at international institutions, instrumentally using uh, most of the time international law for various uh, international projects of their own. I look at that group of people who uh, in a suave manner move between diplomatic positions and legal positions. It's a very small and in itself insignificant and often intellectually not a very powerful group of people. So they, these are people who wouldn't read much anthropology more than to have a five minute conversation at the guest at the dinner table. But uh, nevertheless, this is a group of people which has some political oomph. It's not an academically oriented group of people. It shares a consciousness that I've identified as a late 19th century consciousness. That consciousness to me seems now to be breaking up. And, and the, so, okay, legal anthropologists are tormented about the ethics of what they do. International lawyers are tormented about what it is that we have been doing and whether we still have business in the world or whether other, uh, whether the world is governed no longer by our kinds of institution but other kinds of uh, institution. I am interested in my, to try to intervene in the debate among those people, those politically oriented institutional lawyers in the UN and in public international institutions to say, hey, you can think about your profession in a wider fashion by reading some stuff, by understanding your own projects by reference to how predecessors that were doing something like you were doing, how they went about it, how they failed, how they, where they succeeded. Um, I, I'm constantly struck by the, the very, uh, very strong boundaries uh, or high walls between the various legal specialisms. I don't think public international lawyers really read legal anthropology, so I, I don't really think legal anthropologists read too much public international law. I'm not sure whether it's a good thing to tear that wall down or not. That's not part of my project. Joe, um, Joe Merkins from the Law Department. Um, I understand your analysis or your criticism of the histories of international law, um, especially when you say, um, but I want to ask you whether you would extend your critique of international law uh, to universal human rights, for example. Do you see human rights also as an expansion, uh, oh, sorry, as part of the imperial expansion and as an outgrowth of empire and oppression, or would you apply a different kind of critique to human rights? Do you see something truly universal, for example, about human rights, or is it um, all relative? No, human rights is a technical vocabulary that grew out, as Sam Moyne has pointed pointed out in the 60s and 70s from some struggles that were waged. In, uh, that's one story about them. Human rights have branched out of the language of law at various moments. Sometimes those branches have died and led to nothing. At some other points, they ha have led to some things. I, I, I don't think so. The, all of these legal languages, these le legal idioms, whether they be human rights idiom, criminal law idiom, private law idioms, the idiom of the contract, they, we, all of them had, have, have had their powerful moments when they've been drawing ambitious people to talk in them, to, to appropriate those languages and to do things through them. <clears throat> Just as often as there have been moments when those languages have, be have lost their power, have become dead languages, I see human rights at this moment slowly becoming a dead language. People wanted to achieve the kinds of things, the kinds of uh, moderately left things that I want to achieve in the world, no longer feel that, well, human rights can perhaps no longer do that. We have to invent some other way of doing that. So um, I, I feel uncomfortable with the, with the ever-recurring jurisprudential debate concerning universal and, and particular. I've never seen a universal thing come to me. I've just heard people speak in particular languages and I feel, well, I can understand those languages, I can analyze how those languages operate, where they're, ac I can look at moments when they were attractive and moments when they no longer are attractive. But as to questions of whether they address something universal or whether they are merely particular or merely 
utterances of particular desire. That's a debate in which also I have no interest. Um, thank you very much. Um, your argument about international law, I feel, is one that, slightly following on from that question, could almost be extended to any of the social sciences, and indeed is being extended across the social sciences. And my question is really that um, we don't see the same thing in the natural sciences, and I'm just interested in the comparison. Darwinism, Isaac Newton, Einstein, the core figures in the natural sciences are very Eurocentric. It is a, and historically, the natural sciences have been equally bound up in oppressive political regimes of imperialism, Darwinism especially. I'm wondering why, um, why you feel that the social sciences attract this form of critique so much more, why we don't feel the need to extend it across effectively all of our fields of inquiry? Well, uh, the question contains its own answer. Natural sciences have this hardness about it. When we speak the language of natural sciences, we feel that we are really inside the thing itself, that it's, not, that it's the thing that speaks and not uh, we just ch choosing a vocabulary. Uh, so I, I suppose one can say that social scientists are more used to relativizing their own position. It's not a particular strength of Darwinists to relativize their Darwinism. I'm more, more interested in economics, which sort of straddles social, between social, scientists, uh, social sciences and natural sciences. And, and, and my present project is to, is to try to relativize the way we talk of in international economic matters by historicizing the concepts and the vocabularies that emerged together with uh, modern international law in the 18th in the 17th and 18th century. And let's see what happens, whether economists will put out the light. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you've said that one of your goals is to uh, illuminate practitioners um, in the field, um, which makes sense given that, that you were one. Um, and I'm just curious as to whether you think that um, really curiosity on the part of the practitioners is really the problem given the fact that Eurocentricity was developed um, with uh, interest at heart um, and whether those practitioners actually have an interest in sustaining um, the current system and, and, and whether you feel that there's actually uh, any point beyond the absurd in, in trying mm. to, to engage in that conversation. That's a huge question but and it addresses the, the cynical consciousness of professionalism in general. Now I think that some parts of the professions are more embedded in their cynical consciousness, others are more open to self-examinations. Those that are more embedded are typically those for whom it goes well, who are in control, so economists. But for those who are no longer in control, whose salaries have been going down and who see themselves well, there are more women in those professions and all these signs of, of their being unim becoming unimportant. There is an existential crisis about aspects of the legal profession, in, including, I think, public international law, which makes them more open to look at themselves from the perspective of their own histories, their past, their vulnerability. Um, so I, I do believe that, that people, for instance, so, I have a, a, a very long experience in the UN, in various UN contexts, and I'm, o I'm often surprised by the openness to which what to, uh, to outsiders often and to myself to, when I enter these institutions seem like completely closed bureaucratic contexts in which no idea can permit. But it's not like that. It's not like that. The uh, human rights expertise, for instance, has changed into rather a reflective and open-ended series of uh, professional activities uh, in which I think, so I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm not optimistic in the sense that these people will be empowered in five minutes against some other people, but I am optimistic in as much as there is an intellectual interest out there to understand. Unfortunately, that interest is triggered by the sense that we are losing, we are losing control and also including on our, our, ourselves and our vocabularies. The issue of, and I end with this, the issue of fragmentation, the development of increasingly technical legal idioms that no longer speak to the 
uh, to the moral ambitions of the profession. <laughs> that's, that's a big issue. Yes. Professor, uh, what would you say to the claim, with, to the claim dealing with your centrism, whether critical or affirmative, is to be stuck in the past? Because insofar as the world is now only a world of sovereign states, and Europe's universalist project is complete, there is no longer any such thing as Eurocentrism. Well, uh, that's a nice point, yes. But uh, I wonder about the power of the point. There is a, so the world, as, I far, as, as far as I can see it, is a disaster. And we can deal with that disaster. We have various techniques and vocabularies through which we address the world. Now, we can, of course, say that everything is fine because Eurocentrism is the world now, but uh, and in, a, in, a, in some intellectual sense, that's as far as it goes. So that, that's, that's a good answer, but it doesn't help. And I, so, uh, it's, so there is this big problem that I see in discussions in international relations, in the profession of in IR, in international law, in social sciences, which deals with this question of universality. We speak of empty universals and how, does, how do particulars become universals, etc. And I find that a very unproductive series of discourses. Things, the universal and the particular are an existential predicament, I like to say. Now let's get on with it and let's work with the vocabularies that we have. And so, um, whether it's Eurocentric or non-Eurocentric in some metaphysical way, you're right, is unimportant. The, the important thing is that if we understand, if, if from our understanding that something has a certain genealogy, that the way we've come here is through certain series of maneuvers, gives us the ability to operate in today's world in a better way, that is to say, to deal with the disaster, damn it, then that should be done but not as a philosophical exercise about universal or particular or Eurocentric or non-Eurocentric. I think there was a lady. Um, is there somebody? No, okay, gentlemen. Hello. Uh, I would actually slightly disagree with the, my predecessor in the sense that we can completely depart from the Eurocentrism, and my question actually sort of points towards that point. Because... Uh, Still, as you said, a lot of international institutions like the United Nations, World Bank, International Monetary Fund have, are based on the European or at least Anglo-Saxon plus European concepts. And it, even, it is even clearly reflected in the voting powers in those institutions and the fact that you know, we only exchange American for an American as a president of the World Bank or European as a, for a European as a president of the IMF. And my question is that I sense that in the West now there is a debate because, of course, the economic power is shifting, the political power is shifting east. And there is a debate, do we actually still try to hold on to those bastions of power like the IMF and the uh, World Bank as Europeans and Americans, or do we try to inv invite China, India, Brazil, other uh, developing nations to get more and more power, but also therefore more responsibility in those institutions. And my question is, do you A, think that there is at all appetite, say in countries like India, Brazil, China, to take the global role? And if there is this appetite, do you believe that if we do not let them in now, they will try to create a competing world order? Or if we do let them in, do you believe that the Eurocentric heritage of those institutions will make it difficult more difficult or maybe more enriching for them to actually act through those forums? Uh, to me, Eurocentrism is above all the dominance of a certain language and thereby a certain consciousness. Anybody can enter that language, can be a, a, a user of that language and, and can inhabit that consciousness. The Chinese can, and they do. The Indians can, and they do. Um, it's, I have to say, completely uh, irrelevant for me whether the World Bank is headed by an Indian, American, Finnish, British, whatever uh, language speaker of the language that is spoken in the World Bank today. Um, the shifts, the future shifts in the power between place between Beijing uh, 
or Hong Kong or uh, Tokyo, well, whatever places. Those are uninteresting from the perspective of, of my question, which would be, well, okay, so that's, those are the people who speak, but what is it that they speak? And I tend to hear a language in which people like John Locke and Hugo Grotius, uh, et cetera, would be completely at home. Um, and that's my worry. <laughs> that it's not what the color of skin or the background of the speaker is. I need to liberate Professor Koskinyemi in a minute, but perhaps I might just conclude by asking a final, uh, very simple uh, and probably obvious question, which is this. You said at one point that histories of international law were as Eurocentric as the world they described. Well, if Eurocentricity was once a symptom of something else, something larger, mustn't we assume it continues to be so? And if that's the case, then um, however um, valuable and uh, helpful these four techniques are that you've outlined, what basis do we have for thinking that they'll actually change anything? Presumably they were available to people in the past too. Why are conditions, and this comes back in a sense to the question that was posed by the gentleman in the middle at the back, what basis do we have for being more optimistic today that we can overcome this tenacious Eurocentricity that you wonderfully traced? Well, Susan, that would be your kind of a question, wouldn't it? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's damn hard. So as a historian, <laughs> as a historian, one of course, I can always hide behind just saying, well, I just recount the past. What can I say about what these stories are able to achieve today? I think there is a, so, I, but I think we have to realize that the world isn't the same. These, the, the role of these stories to the world of exchanges of power and money is different today than it, than it once was. Uh, I, I said earlier that, that I think the world is a disaster and that we have all these techniques and languages through which we make it possible for us not to see the, uh, the disaster. My thing is just a, an old-fashioned enlightenment thing. It is to just to, to, let's look at this thing as a disaster. Let's, uh, uh, let's imagine that international legal work can be a critique of ideology. And let's assume that after the work of ideology critique has, has finished, people can look in the world, realize that the, that the disaster that is there, and take action in order to improve what they can. I'm, this is not my, I find myself completely naked, or let's say mute, in terms of the languages of progress that would then have to be employed once enlightenment has taken over. So please join me in thanking Professor Koskinyemi for an incredible <laughs>